Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing this morning? Come on. It was nice. 65 degrees. I walked out of the door and I was like, hallelujah. Jesus, you're so good. Ha, you've never been so good, Lord. Ha. I was, I, was, I was just doing a little walk to my car. I was just really excited this morning. Because, uh, guys, I'm like an abominable sm- snowman, if you don't know that. So it was, it, it, was a good, it was a good morning. Well, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, uh, my name is Lucas Rosner, and I get to be on staff here at Brave Church, and I'm super honored that you're joining us. Um, can we give it up one time for people who are maybe joining us for the first time, like we do every week? Keep those hands going, because how about the people who got baptized last week? Come on, that was so awesome. Going public with their faith. Come on, that, that, was, that was awesome. We had, the, we had the trough down. down. Hey, it was hot last week. Hey, proud of all y'all who stayed there last week. It wasn't 65 last week, I'll tell you that right now. We were down there celebrating, and it is a celebration, so we were super excited about that. Well, uh, let me just give you a, a couple announcements real quick. Keep you in the loop with everything church life. Uh, if you don't know this trail map in July, we're kind of taking a break in July. There's just, we got Serve Day coming up next week, the 15th. Anybody excited for Serve Day? Come on, Serve Day's awesome. If you haven't uh, really heard about Serve Day, it's your opportunity to see your footprint as the local church in your community. And you can go check out our website and actually sign up. We got two stations that you can do this year. We got kind of more of a construction site if you want to get your hands a little bit more dirty. Uh, we have a, uh, one of our very own, Renee, in in the house. She uh, she has a house project that we're going to be working on and helping her out, pulling up carpet. You know, I mean, you're going to get sweaty either way. So wear some clothes that you are not wanting to uh, keep, if you know what I'm saying. So we got a construction kind of site that's uh, in Minnetonka over here. And then we also have a, we're, we're serving at the Mound, downtown Mound Parade. We're going to be handing out waters. Some people are walking. So I mean, you're going to get sweaty either way. So like I said, you just got to pick which kind of situation you like a little bit more. But Serve Day is coming up, so we're taking a little break from Trail Map, but if you don't know exactly what Trail Map is, Trail Map is our story. It's a chance we, we do two steps. It's basically two lunches we feed you, so you can just come hang out if you've never been a part. We want you to join us, but Trail Map is, uh, is our our way of connecting with you for us to hear our story, how we work around here, how we do church, and also we want to hear your story. We want, we want to hear how you, uh, how you came to our church, and, and we want to hear how you your life. So uh, that is trail map. Uh, step one and step two is a lot of fun. We do like personality tests and on how God has gifted you because I heard it said this way, uh, there are two, the two biggest days in your life are the day you were born and the day that you figured out why. So we want to, we want to partner with you on figuring out, Hey, why were you put on this planet? Was it, was it just to go to the grocery store? No, it was not. Okay. Uh, that is not, that is not what that... <laughs> I don't know where that was going, but uh, that's that. That's step two. It's a lot of fun, so we want you to be a part. But in August, we're going to do all four weeks in August. Uh, we're going to do step one on the first week, step two on the second week, and then we're going to go both ways. So if you want to be a part, sign up in August, and then uh, after that, we're going to go to uh, two times a month, all right? Does that does that make sense? Trail map. You got to go. It's a good time. I know it's a, especially it's really great with you with a friend or a uh, a spouse because when you're there you see the personality uh, tests that they get and you're like I knew you had OCD I knew it I just never had a test to prove it but now I do you know so that's that okay um, next I want to shout out because I'm up here and I get to shout out a men's night we're doing a men's night coming up on uh, J- July 20 no no July 26th. July 26th, we're going to Excelsior Commons. We're doing a barbecue. We're going to be playing spike ball. We might even break out some pickleball, honestly. I know there's a tennis court over there somewhere. I've got to get my pickleball on. Uh, but we're doing that. And if you if you want to come, uh, you can talk to me, Jared, my dad, or even Mark Kleppy, and we'll give you all the details for that on the times and everything. And also, it's a great, the summer is a great opportunity for you to invite somebody, not only to church, maybe maybe if you don't really know somebody who's very churched, a, 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 a men's event or a women's event or a small group or whatever that is, that's the perfect opportunity to invite somebody, not to just push Jesus down their throat, but get to know somebody, get to know their, their name, maybe their middle name, you know what I'm saying? You got to get to know these people. And so those are great opportunities for that. So that's that. Uh, Last little thing. um, 
this is a connect card. Um, if you have not filled one out yet and you want to be connected with all things Brave Church, fill one of these out. What are you doing already? All right, come on. We're not stalking nobody. Just fill it out. Uh, we want to keep you up to date with the men's events and the women's events and the young adults events and all those things. So this connect card is the best opportunity for you to be in the loop of those things. And it pulls off super easy. See, there's kind of like a track there, you know. And uh, these should be found in the back of your pews right there. And you can drop it off in the offering bin in the back. And um, also on these, uh, we have this little thing that says, how can we pray for you? And this is a great opportunity for you to join us together as praying for each other. We're a praying church. We believe in community. And that's what it's about, all right? So there's your connect card. Make sense? Thumbs up. Y'all tired of me yet? All right, I know you are. Okay, here we go. Pastor JJ, come on. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Thanks, brother. All right. Um, yeah, one thing I just wanted to add to what he had to say is around the lobby, there's little signs, little stand-up signs on the different tables. There's a QR code on there if you want more information about Serve Day and how to serve. Just use the QR code there, and you can let us know. Thanks, bud. Uh, you can let us know that uh, you want to be a part and where you want to serve because we've got a couple different areas for people to kind of serve in this year, which is exciting, yeah? All right, yeah, we're excited. I, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm apparently excited. Um, and remember, as of last week, I'm now grading your participation in church on Sunday mornings. Okay, if you weren't here, you just missed out. So you'll have to go watch the video from, from, from last week. So. All right, let me open up my notes. One of the other things I also wanted to kind of just shout out real quick, I know Lucas said it, but, you know, baptisms last week was a big deal because that was a milestone for us. That was like first time doing baptisms as Brave Church and here at this building. And, man, it was really a, an awesome, awesome milestone for our church. But also the one thing that I wanted to point out with that, and I said it in, in the morning in our team rally this morning, um, but... One of the things that was in our heart when, when we wanted to relaunch the church as Brave Church is we wanted to make a place for the prodigals to be able to come home. And, um, and what was awesome is of everybody that got baptized last week, it was just a very clear picture of watching the prodigals not come home to like us or come home to a church, but to come home to the kingdom. And, um, and it was just this awesome moment of watching a few young people who said, who said, man, it's time for me to come back to the, to the family of God. And, and it was an amazing, it was just an amazing time if you were there. Um, and I wish I had, I wish I had permission and time to be able to share with you all the kind of the, 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 the backstage stage past story and some of the lives that are there and hopefully we can share those in the future because it's just it's powerful when somebody turns their life and comes back to the Lord after after you know saying yes to Jesus and walking away in your life and and all of a sudden you're carrying the weight of your own sin again having the opportunity to let God take that burden off your life it's so powerful and those stories in people's life are powerful as well I mean it's it's really cool all right Get to the message, JJ, stop talking. All right, we're in this series called The Culture of the Kingdom, and today we're talking about the culture of first, the culture of first, of first things. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And the thing that's important about having a culture of first in your life and your home when you're putting God first, when you're putting Jesus first, when you're seeking first his kingdom, is that what it does is whatever you put first, has the power to really bless the rest of your life. And so what we end up doing is we put a lot of things first in our lives, but they don't really have the power to do anything in our lives. They just, they have the power to suck resources out of our lives, right? They have the power to suck our time out of our life. They have the power. But, you know, it's amazing when you put Jesus first, all of a sudden, you know, the sun starts to stand still for people like it did for Joshua, right? And the sun's, the, you know, all, all of a sudden battles start getting won because the power of the Holy Spirit's at work in your life. And, and supernatural things start to happen in your life because now God is kind of in his rightful place in your life. And if you didn't know this or not, I don't know if you knew this or not, but you know, God doesn't like being second. He was first, he is first, he'll always be first, and like he won't take a different place in not just your life and my life, but he won't take a second place in his kingdom. He is the king. 
So he becomes first. So we have, to come, we have to come to terms with this reality when we're talking about living within the culture of the kingdom of God um, as people that say we're Christ followers and that we belong in this kingdom. And I love the way that the psalmist says it in Psalm 90, verse 12. This is David speaking to the Lord. He's, he's, he's going, hey, God, teach us to number our days aright. And you'll see, you'll see the scripture up here on the screen real quick. Go. My, there it is. My finger doesn't work nearly as well. So um, it teach us to number our days. Uh, this version doesn't have it. Sorry. The version that's on my, on my screen does. That's my bad. Sorry, Allie. I gave you the wrong version for the scripture. Um, but what it says is, it says, teach us to number our days aright. And what I, 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 I like the fact that it puts that word aright in there because there's a wrong way to also number your days. And what happens is, he goes on to say, number right, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. See, it's like when, when we know how to number our days aright, when we know how to put first things first, what God does is he turns around and he turns it into wisdom in our lives. He turns it into something that we need in our lives, a piece of information that we need to make good decisions in our lives. He turns it into um, uh, when, when we don't quite understand why bad things are happening in our lives, all of a sudden God pops wisdom into that in our lives because our life is ordered in the proper direction. We have numbered our days aright. And this is so important in the kingdom because everything with God is about first things. Amen. Okay, I'll keep going. It's good. It's good. And the reason that it's that way, though, is because God, one of the things that he does, it's not the only thing he does, but one of the things that God does is that he takes people that are in his kingdom and he puts, like, favor and he puts blessing and there's good things on his life. Now, there are times when... He needs you to teach you a lesson and, you know, there's a good healthy rebuke that kind of comes our way once in a while when we make bad choices and there's all that. But really what God is trying to do is, is elevate your life into a place of blessing. It's, it's why Jesus th said things like the last will be first, the first will be last. There's a reason why he says to his believers, listen, you're, you're, you're going to be, uh, uh, you're, you're the... Uh, what am I trying to say right now? I don't have the scripture memorized. Apparently, uh, I'm struggling this morning. Um, if you're watching on video, I'm sorry. Just fast forward this part. It's okay, all right? For everybody else, though, um, a big part of what Jesus is trying to do, he's trying to make you the light of the world, right? So the way that you live your life is supposed to reflect the goodness of who God is. Jesus, you know, uh, this, the psalmist said, taste and see that the Lord is good right? Well, how do people taste and see? Well, they see God's goodness on your life. And so, you know, I, I'm not trying to overplay the, the, this idea that God wants to bring blessing and good things into your life because it's not just for you. He's trying to bless you so that you can be a blessing to other people with your time, your talent, your stuff. Listen, people that have, are people of influence, you don't know this, but God's trying to use your influence to even elevate the kingdom. Like everything that he places inside your life, he's trying to get you to be a light to the world. Do you guys see that? All right. So I'm not going to beat that. I'm not going to beat that horse to death any longer, but I need, you have to be able to see the place that God's trying to get you to, because then you can see why it's important for you to put him first in all things, because then there's a power that comes on your life that allows you to reflect his goodness. Okay. All right, all right. I see heads shaking of uh, about half of you, and the other half of you are like, I'm not convinced yet. JJ, we've got 20 minutes, though, so convince me. You're welcome. I will, I'll try my best to do that, all right? But the order of your life, what you say yes to and what you say no to, will ultimately allow you to accomplish more in life, but it also displays to ourselves and to others what's important to us. So like parents, if you want your kids to know that God's important to you, like they have to actually see that God's important to you, right? So we lead by example in our lives. If you want your coworker to see that God's important to you, it's probably good for you not to like swear at them and yell at them when they make mistakes at work. Did that hit a little closer to home? Was that a little better? I, I mean, I see people smiling. Okay, we're getting there. Uh, we're, we're starting to get a little bit closer to the target here. Too many times we have values that we say are important to us, but the way we live our lives demonstrates something else. And the reason why that's 
painful is because when you have a gap in your lifestyle and your values, it creates a certain amount of pain in your life because you, you end up living two different lives. And so when we're living our lives in the kingdom and we say that we're Christ followers and Christians, however, we live our life a little bit differently on you know, Monday through Saturday instead of just on Sunday putting the good face on and we tell everybody how blessed we are all the time. Um, what it does is it creates a pain in our life because we feel like we're living two different lives. We have to close that gap because as Christians, we, must, we have to come to terms with the fact that our identity is, is built on what we believe. The, our identity is built on who it is we say we are in the life that we want to live. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, it says, and, and, and this is God's plan. I would love to know God's plan. Thank you very much that both Gentiles... And Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. That's awesome. I want to share in God in the inheritance that God has for his children. Don't you? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. So he's, he's trying to paint this picture of this, this culture that we're supposed to live in if we say that we're Christians, if we say that we're followers of Jesus. And then he makes this statement down in verse 10. It says that God's purpose in all this was to use the church, to use you. When you, see, when you see the term the church in scripture, it's not talking about a building, it's talking about a people of God, right? Jesus is the head, Ephesians talks about this, right? Jesus is the head, he's the bridegroom, the church is the bride, we're supposed to come together on some level and live our lives cohesively together. This is what this is supposed to look like. So when you see the word church in there, it's not just talking about a building, it's talking about a people, it's talking about you. So God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display the wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. In other words, not only do people at work see your behavior and what you really believe, but like there's spiritual forces that are at work around that actually see that you mean what you say you mean. And if you want to know more about that, listen to last week's message, all right? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6 says this, says that in all your ways acknowledge him. In all your ways acknowledge him. The order determines... The order of our life kind of determines this blessing that's on our lives. So when it says in all of our ways, like what is he talking about? Like what, what do you mean all of our ways? Like at work? Yep. At home? Yep. With our stuff? Yep. Like in all of our ways, we have to figure out how we're going to acknowledge God if we're in the kingdom and put him first. And in God's kingdom... God has always been first. Let me give you a couple of tips here. God's always has been first. Like he's, he's kind of the first from the beginning. I mean, the first words in the Bible are in the beginning, God, right? From the very beginning, he was and is, and at the end, he will continue to be. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Verse 18, he is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. And like, he literally means everything. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, this shouldn't be in your notes, but it's, this is Isaiah speaking as a prophet. He's speaking the voice of God. He says, I am the first and the last. There is no other God besides me. God always, has always been first. He's always going to be first. But something else we have to come to terms with is the fact that he will be first. And the reason why this is important is because we just have a tendency because we're human beings. Like if you were to take a iPhone screen and, and put it, if like if Neuralink was, was, a, was a thing and Elon Musk finished that up and he had a, a Neuralink attached to everybody's head and there was a you know, screen attached to everybody's forehead, um, it, it would be on the me application 24 hours a day. Like that's where it would be. Because left unto ourselves, people always make it about themselves. And so what ends up happening, though, is that we end up ordering our lives in a way where we kind of forget that, you know, God, like God doesn't just stop forgetting that he's first, everybody. Like, no, 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 he's going to be first. 
we just end up getting left out of all the rest of the good things that happen in life and that happen in the kingdom because we are not ordering our lives in a way where he's first. This is way too ouchy for this, for Sunday morning, all right? Like, like this message should not be this ouchy for everybody. I mean, I know we're Minnesotans in the middle of summer, but this should not be an ouchy message, okay? Like, the, this, is, this is foundational to our Christian lives. God is first. He's always going to be first. There's no other place that God is going to take. There's no other place that is acceptable for God to have in our lives. Because at the end of the day, and this one's, now this is the part of the message that was supposed to be ouchy, okay? Right here. Because God is either Lord of all, in our lives or he is not Lord at all in our lives. Like there, there's, there's no like secondary place that God's going to take because you just decided that that's not the priority. No, it's like he, it's, but JJ, that's kind of black and white, isn't it? Yeah, man, he's God. Like the fact that he's God is what gives him the ability to say, I'm the guy. And so what we do is like we, we end up inadvertently, and I do this too, so like I'm not putting this on you. My job is to get the guilt off you, not put it on you, everybody. But here's the thing, when God, when Jesus, when God is Lord of all in your life, you know what it does? It gets the guilt off your life. Because scripture says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins to him, that he's just to forgive us of all unrighteousness, and he actually takes our sin and removes it from us as far as the east is to the west. Right? So it's like when he's Lord of all, it doesn't put guilt on, it gets the guilt off of us. Like this is good news, right? The problem is we live in a society that's trying to do everything it possibly can to get you to put God second because the devil runs the things and culture that's out there and he wants to destroy everything that matters to the heart of God. And guess what? You matter to the heart of God. All right, so we have to see this properly instead of seeing this as like a guilt, like a do, don't do, you know, uh, balls and strikes, calling it on other people's lives. No, 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 it's not about everybody else. This is about us internally, personally, making sure that God is first in our lives. And let me just confront something that has just so culturally become acceptable. And I'll say this, cult Christian culturally has become acceptable. It's like we have this idea as Christians in Christianity that as long that we can like do Christianity on our own terms. You know, it's like I don't know. I mean, it's almost hard to articulate and put my finger on it. But if you've been a Christian for very long, you absolutely know what I'm talking about because you've seen people that do this over and over again where it's become like their Christian norm is they just do Christianity on their own terms instead of on God's terms. And then, like, these are the people that we call hypocrites. And these are the people that the world looks at and goes, well, that's a hypocrite. And that's why I don't want to go to church. And these are the people that say, well, well church just wants your money. And, you know, it, it, it's because of we've, we've accepted this type of cultural Christianity, this, Christ, this, this like culturally okay to be kind of Christians we want to be and not, and, and, and not be. And where it's like, hey, we're not going to necessarily put God first in all the relationships in our life, just in certain relationships in our life. Or we're not gonna we're not gonna put God first in our money, just you know, like like sometimes, but not all the time. Or or we're not gonna put God first in, in, in our career because you know that's I mean that's our career and my 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 company is really this way and their culture is this way. Like you hear that a lot, like corporate culture. Have you guys heard that term? Yeah, no? couple people. Come on, Vicky, where yeah, you you've heard you've heard the term corporate culture. Yes, you have. Um, right, right? And did, did that exist because they want you to have a certain behavior within the company that you're in, right? But your career is secondary to who you are, you are as an identity as, as a Christian. And sometimes those cultures clash. So then what do we do when they clash? Well, God has to win. Yeah, but my company doesn't like it when X, Y, Z. God doesn't care. But my company really likes to elevate these social programs that I think are really bad for society and I just have to go along. No, you don't. But I might lose my job. You might. It's getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. Come on, somebody. 
But the reason is, is this is hitting us so at home is because we've watched cultural, we've watched corporate culture start to turn the culture of society in ways that are very unhealthy. This is very real for us right now. And it's almost like at least our country, I can't speak for other countries, but it's like we've been forced to a tipping point. I personally think that's a good thing. Like, let's just get it over with. I mean, the, the choice now is getting very clear, right? Like, it's not, it's, it's not nearly as ambiguous as it once was before. When, when we were all under the impression that, you know, oh, they just had everybody's best interest in mind and they want the best thing for their customers so they can make more money and really? Like that's, I mean, the shroud or the shade that was over that has just been pulled back from society and everybody can see it now. This is a beautiful thing. Now it's very easy to make that decision. Problem is for you, Christ follower, is that now you have to make the decision of like, are you going to actually put God first in all things? Is Jesus going to be Lord of all? Or will he not be Lord at all in our lives? Now, here's the great thing about God. Is that God wants your best interest in mind. He wants to bless you and put favor on your life. So it's amazing how you can take a stance that a bunch of people won't like, but they still like you. And they don't even know why. Because there's something spiritual that's at work. It's like the love of God comes out of you in a way that affects people. And all of a sudden, they're like, you know, we don't really like what he says, but we just like him a lot. And all of a sudden, there's favor that's on your life. Like, as a matter of fact, like, he won't go around, like, he's not going to, you know, toe the corporate line. But, you know, we're going to give him a raise anyway. We're going to give her a raise anyway. Why? I don't know. It's because God's at work because you put him first in your life. If you seek him first, all these other things will be added unto you, but there's a spiritual battle that's at play in our lives. There's a, there's a spiritual battle that's at play in your life. And it, it's not just you, it's like culture, like society within your corporation, sometimes within the churches, within our, you know, our, our local governments for sure. Within our neighborhoods, absolutely. But you have to be able to see it clearly now. And then put God in his rightful place anyway. You know, Jesus had this um, interaction with a man. As a matter of fact, we'll just throw the scripture up there. It's in Luke chapter 9, verse 59. And he says this, and it seems callous at first, at first glance when we read this together, everybody. Um, but Jesus said, he said to another man, hey, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Stop there. Like, that's a good thing, right? Hey, my dad passed away. Let me go bury my dad. Now, culturally, their idea of a funeral is a little bit different than ours. There was some time that was involved. And at first glance, that sounds logical. And then Jesus says something that makes all of us go like, What? Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That sounds callous. I mean, let's just be honest, right? I mean, I've got a loved one right now that is, that's suffering from brain cancer, um, and, and I would hate for Jesus to say something like that to me when I wanted to follow him and I couldn't go and pay my last respects, right? Like, that'd be hard. I'm, am I the only one? Come on, all right, all right, okay. You're working on like a B today. It's good. Don't ruin it, all right? Okay, so, so Jesus makes this statement, but there's more going on that meets the eye here, okay? This is the firstborn son, and the firstborn son, not only does he need to be there for the burial of his father, but he stands to gain everything in the family, like, like the entire inheritance of the family goes to this man. So there's like just much more going on there. It's like, okay, am I going to put Jesus first and follow him, or... I mean, I'm going to get everything from the family if I show up, right? So now all of a sudden, there's a much greater like, wrestle that's happening here. And it's the same wrestling that we do with material things and God, material things and how we're going to serve God, relationships and how we're going to serve God. You know, Jesus just has such a greater perspective where he's like, he knows what eternity looks like. And he's like, dude, 
Your father's going to be in eternity cheering you on. He doesn't care about all the rest of that stuff. But it goes against like our, what our regular thought process is many times because Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Check this one out in verse 61. It says, still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, ooh, next one, 61, what is it, 62? 62. All right. So that one's not on there. Golly, I blew it. Sorry, sorry, you guys. It's not their fault. I send them the notes. So that's, that, that's my fault. Let me just read it to you. And if you don't believe me, just oh, bring a paper Bible next week or grab one out of the pew. There's like one right in the back of the pew there for, for you. Um, but this is what Jesus said in verse 61, 62. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Ouch. You know why that's hard for me is because as a pastor who's planted a church, there's been a lot of people that have come and gone. There's people that have come on the team and just said, ah, oh, that's not for me. And I wanted to just go, ouch. Now, I, wouldn't, I personally wouldn't go as far to say you're not fit for the kingdom of God. But again, there's just more going on than me. Yeah, Jesus seems callous here at first glance, but he's not saying that you need to say goodbye to all your relationships and walk away from them. As a matter of fact, Jesus taught us that he's trying to turn you into the light of the world for all your relationships. I believe it's in Luke 11. This is not in my notes. This is from memory, so I'm for sure not going to quote it properly, but you, you can read it another time. Um, if you want to look it up, you just look for the Tower of Siloam. And what happened is the Tower of Siloam fell down and it killed 19 people. And Jesus' disciples, they come to him and they go, hey, why did all these people have to die? Anybody have that question when you know, bad things happen to good people? Man, I do. And Jesus answers them and goes, Back up. So the disciples say, hey, why did they have to die? Was it because there was sin in their life, essentially? Right? And Jesus goes, hey, whether they sin or not, everybody's going to die sooner or later. That's essentially what his, his, his message is. And then he tells them this parable, which is what he did many times. He'd tell a story to try and illustrate something. But the parable, at first glance, does not seem like it has anything to do with the story. And it's about this fig tree. It says that the, the, the owner of the vineyard and the gardener go walking through the vineyard and they come across this fig tree that has not been producing any figs or any fruit for three years. And the owner goes by this fig tree and says, cut that thing down and we'll plant a new tree next year. And the gardener goes, hey, just, just, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's dig up around it. Let's fertilize it. And next year, if it doesn't have any fruit on it, then we'll cut it down. End of story. The next scene is like several days later. That's it. Like that's Jesus' answer to a bunch of his disciples that came and said, hey, why do bad things happen to good people? It's like, what does that have to do with anything? This is why. And this is why this connects to this story. It's because for you to get through crisis, anybody, anybody ever been through a crisis? Like you've had somebody die, financial crisis, something as bad has happened in your life, full of anxiety and sorrow, you don't know what decisions to make next. Listen, those are hard moments. And this is what we do in those moments because it's logical, it makes sense, it's rational. From the outside looking in, well-meaning people give us crappy advice and they say things like, you know what, you just need to slow down in your life, take a few things off the burner that's, hap that's going on in your life so that you can just relax and get through this season of your life, right? Isn't that what people tell you and that what we tell, have told other people and whatnot? This is what Jesus said. If you want to get through crisis, like you're bumming because 19 people just got killed when a tower randomly fell down and killed a bunch of people, this is how you get through that. You go and bear fruit. So if you'll stay connected to what God has called you to do, created you to do, guess what you'll do? You'll see the goodness of God and you'll sail through those moments of crisis in your life. But this is what people do, is they take the thing that they're called to do, 
Maybe they're serving at church. Maybe it's with a different organization. Maybe, maybe they're mentoring a group of young people and they go, man, I've got too much going on in my life to be continuing to do that right now. It's really not all that important anyway. They take that off the back burner so they can do everything else. And you know what happens? The crisis in their life diverts them straight out of the kingdom. And you watch it happen in their lives. And maybe that's happened to you. Where all of a sudden you took like a three year hiatus from your calling and all of a sudden three years later you realize, man, I just don't love Jesus as much as I once did. I don't know why. You know what? My faith just seems really dry right now. I don't get it. Have you ever been through those like desert moments in your faith where you're like, man, I just don't know if I sense the Holy Spirit and the joy like I used to and all those things. You know why? It's because like we stopped bearing fruit and all of a sudden we started to wither up like that tree that Jesus was talking about. I don't know. Somebody needed to hear that. That's not in my notes at all. But this is what happens when he is not Lord of all. When he's Lord of all, though, we sail through the things of life because he's with us. He gives us the peace of God that passes all understanding. It guards our hearts and our minds. Isaiah said that if we keep our minds stayed on him, that he will keep us in perfect peace. It's 12 o'clock. I'm just like getting started. A couple of people said that. Everybody else is like, I got lunch to get to, man. <laughs> All right. Three practical steps to keeping Jesus first in your life, keeping God first in your life, having a culture of first in your life. Number one, no one likes talking about it. We're going to talk about it this morning. You got to put God first in what you treasure. You got to put God first in your money. Amen. We'll just move on right past that one. All right. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21. For your treasure, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I didn't say it. Jesus did. People try to translate scriptures like this into things like God doesn't want you to have treasures. No, like have the boat, just use the boat to minister to people. Do you get it? Like put God first in everything. Listen, if, you're, if, if your money is in the things that God is trying to build, then guess where your heart is going to be? In the things that God is trying to build. This, these are very simple concepts. We just don't like them because people have told us, you know, the church just wants your money. Stop doing it for the church. Don't do it for me. Do it for you. Oh, you didn't want to hear that because, you know, you want to keep blaming the church. I know. I know it's okay. I love you all anyway. Whether your heart is there or not is for you and God to work out. It's not for me. And this is why whenever we talk about money here, we don't talk about money very often at all at, at church. You guys know that. However, when we do talk about it, you'll hear me say things like, I want you to pray and ask God what he wants you to do and then just obey that. Because this is what I know is that we'll have way more than enough to, to do serve day and to fulfill vision and to do everything God's putting in our hearts if we'll just obey what he's telling us to do. Right? Like, you don't need me to get up here and manipulate you and do a big building campaign and, man, you need to, you know, promise to give this much over the next several years. We don't need to do any of that. Just ask God what, you're, what he wants you to do and just be a part of that. That's all. This is simple stuff, yeah? Three people thought so. Everybody else thinks it's hard. Okay, all right. Remember, whatever you put first carries the power to bless all the rest, all right? And that's not just your money, it's in all other things as well. Let me move on. Number two, put God first in how you use your talent. God has gifted you. And if you don't know what that is, that's what Trail Map exists for, okay? And honestly, I would love, like my goal over through August, you know, we, we're taking July off of Trail Map, 
I would love to get the entire church to go through Trail Map in the month of August. If you haven't been, this is like the all skate moment. Anybody ever go to like the, the roller gardens when you're a kid? Come on, right? Lake, Lakeville, skate, Skateville, all that stuff. Anybody? Okay, well, they, they always would do this thing where it was an all skate. Was, if you had skates on or not, you'd go out there in your socks and everybody would do like the, you know, the, the chicken dance, you know? Come on, right? Okay. Anyway, August. I'm asking everybody, it's an all skate, to go through Trail Map with us. We'll feed you. We'll give you some good information about just what your next steps are. It's not just about us. And the reason is because God's gifted you. 80% of Christians, according to Barna, have no idea why they're on this planet. 80%. These are people that, like, were born of God. They don't even know why they're here. Guess what? There's a reason why you're here. God put you here on purpose and for a purpose, and we want to help you figure it out. Because when we put God first in our talent, you know what happens? The kingdom just goes. It's a reason why the enemy wants to keep the people of God ignorant to what their gifts and their talents are, everybody. Just think through that for a minute. And serve day is a great day to be a guinea pig to figure out where a good fit for you might be. So come and serve with us at serve day. Let's be a blessing to our community. Number three, put God first in how you spend your time. You know, we actually try to be pretty intentional around this idea around here first part of the year, every year we do 21 days of prayer and fasting. Did you know that um, the first, that January is like the time, the, the most busy time of the year when people come back to church? They're bringing friends, people that have never gone to church before. You know, January 1 rolls around and they're like, man, I got to start working out and I got to go to church. And for us to do 21 days of prayer and fasting for a bunch of people that have no idea what that even means is like a foolish church growth strategy. Did you know that? Like it'd be so much better for us to do like an evangelistic service, sermon series, you know, get people all excited, fired up, talk about, you know, practical things. But you know what? We're going to put God first in our time. And for 21 days, the first 21 days of the year, we are telling God, hey, God, you're first in our lives this year, not just today, but this year. It'd be way smarter for us to do an evangelistic series, but I think it's way smarter for us just to put God first. Be a culture of first. Start out our year with God being number, numero uno. You know, we complicate things like daily devotions and daily devotionals and you know you get people that are all excited about their Bible they're like man you got to read your Bible for an hour pray for an hour every morning and that's great you know but for like normal people they just need to you know go to the throne before they pick up their phone you know what I'm saying <laughs> like so easy for you just to put Jesus first every day by saying, you know what? Throne before phone. Hashtag throne before phone. Hashtag be brave. Okay, there it is. There. there we sufficiently marketed our church on a quippy saying that I didn't make up. Okay, all right. Just put him first with your time. What would happen? Imagine. If this year, you just went to the throne before you went to your phone every day. What would that take you, 30 seconds? I'll tell you what, I'll bet you your day will go different. Some days it won't. <laughs> Some days it'll feel just normal. Peas and carrots type of a day, peanut butter and jelly. But I'd rather know that God is first in my life every day have to guess. You know, I said this last week, and I'm going to say it again, but 
You know, our faith is measured in feet and not feelings. So it doesn't matter what you feel. You know how you know if you're a faithful person? You just look back at the steps, the steps you took. So you can feel very faithless and be very faithful. You can feel very faithful, but yet be very faithless when you look back at those steps in the sand behind you. It's going to put them first in our time, yeah? I mean, it's such a powerful, like, you can just sense the Holy Spirit fall on this moment, can't you? And it's just so practical. It's not overly spiritual. No, God is here. That's why we do church on Sunday, by the way. You know, the Greeks, we turn the, they, they turn the calendar, the Gentiles, they turn the calendar into Sunday being the last day of the week. The Hebrews looked at it as the first day of the week. Why? Just putting God first. Yeah, but pastor, come on. We do a lot of other things in our life besides just Christian things. How's that working out for you? You know, you're never going to tell them. You're never going to catch me being the person that's like, hey, don't go do that. I'm the guy that's going to be like, go do all of it until you, like, you're so sick of it, you want to throw up. And then come back and do it God's way. And then let's see how it goes. I'm like, go for it. Go do all the other things. It's great. But you know what happens? I've been doing this long enough where people come back and they're like, hey, pastor, can we have a meeting? And then I'm like, no, I really need you to read three books first before we have a meeting. Not because I'm aloof, but it's because, man, when you order your life aright, you know what happens? God drops wisdom from heaven into our lives for how we can live our lives. It is the culture of the kingdom to put God first. In every area of our life, we're going to put him first in our treasure. We're going to put him first in our talent, the thing that God has gifted us to do and to be in this world. And by the way, if you'll figure that out and do it, it'll get you through any crisis that will come to your life. It'll get you through every storm that comes in this life. If you'll just do the thing that God created you to do, to take our time and we're going to say, God, you're first in all things. Amen. Come on, would you guys stand with me this morning? Oh, Jesus, we love you. <laughs> God, the culture of your kingdom is first. And so we put you first today. We're going to take it one day at a time. Today, you're first. Would you take our time this morning and would you take our talent. God, I'm so grateful for the talent of so many awesome team members that give their talent to make church service happen so that the prodigals can come home like they did last week and for those that put you first in their treasures so that we can build something special here in the West Metro because we just believe that the world needs a brave church right now. God, we put you first. Maybe you're in the house today and you just know it's your time. You're, like, you, you're one of those prodigals. You need to come back and start putting God first. This is not a big step. We're just going to pray with you. And at Brave Church, we believe that nobody prays by themselves. And so come on, everybody. Let's, let's pray together with, with our brothers and sisters and just say, Dear Jesus, we put you first today. Forgive me. I'm not perfect. Help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everybody. Come on, put your hands together. Yeah, God's good. Well, before I bless you and release you, as many of you know, if you're here for the first time, let this service be our gift to you. But if you believe in what we're doing, you're, you're a brave church member and you want to continue to help fund what we're doing. There's envelopes in the back of the pews. You can use them. There's a giving box in the back. Or you can just give online. You know, almost everybody gives online anyway. Just go to bravechurchmn.com and click give. You can do that there. But outside of that, hey, would you guys go have an awesome week? Come on, let me bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and grant you peace. And may God show you how to order your life aright and drop wisdom on you 
when you do. In Jesus' name, amen, everyone. Amen. You may be dismissed. Thank you.